Since 2015, the world has been starving for a sequel to The Hunger Games. Every man's dream and every woman's queen, Katniss Everdeen, disappeared from the screen. But the world asks for more. If you ask, you shall receive. Lionsgate has delivered a feast of feisty femininity, toxic masculinity, and brave diversity. Here is how Hunger Games 5, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, is an all-singing, all-dancing, awe-inspiring awesome prequel. The film opens with a shot that sends shivers down the modern spine. Is Hunger Games 5 set in the cinematic Stone Ages? Not only is this a white male, but a very white male, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Greek Adonis who is dressed to impress. A family man with a plan, he has his eyes on the prize, the Plinth Prize, an almighty scholarship to pay for his all-important university tuition. Intuition tells him something is wrong, and he is right. This year, the 10th annual Hunger Games will decide the winner of the prize, the Plinth Scholarship. The man whiter than snow, Coriolana Snow, is forced to mentor one of the 24 tributes. What's the catch? The winning mentor must train their tribute to win, and win people's hearts. Are you not entertained? This Hunger Games is hungry for a bloodbath and blockbuster TV ratings. For 15 long minutes, the protagonist of Hunger Games 5 is a male. A straight white snappy dresser, straight out of a Jane Austen white wet fantasy. Has the world gone backwards? Has Lionsgate shut the gate on modern values? Fear not, for the fog soon clears and the real hero appears. Who needs Coriolanus Snow when you can have Snow White? Corio has won the lotto. The 24 tributes have a roll call of Willy Wonka rejects. As diverse as a flight on Virgin Atlantic, but as dangerous as a fight with a 40-year-old virgin, the fancy-dressed fashionista can't believe his hungry luck. Lucy Gray Baird is a guitar-wielding Boudicca. She speaks like Scarlett O'Hara, sings like Dolly Parton, and fighting in the face of such a fierce feminine furnace. Coriolanus is not the only anus on campus, there is also Serge Anus, Corio's BFF and rival mentor. Bro Anus is not so lucky, his tribute stands no chance in an arena of gladiatorial diversity. His tribute is the weakest of the weak, a lamb to the slaughter, a cisgender sissy male from District 2. Standing in the way of Snow White and her white male mentor, the visage of pure villainy, Dr. Volumnia Gaul. She's the brains behind the games, Jigsaw Gaul, and a cross between Saw Gerrera and a cat from Red Dwarf. Hi, buddy! Voluptuous Gaul has the goal to ask all the mentors for killer suggestions. 23 of the mentors have the combined creativity of the Writers Guild of America. Coriolanus the Heinous takes like a duck to water, a snake to Swan Lake, a shark to Tornado. He has more ideas for killing than Kevin McAllister, and more ideas for killer ratings than Damon Killian. Cruella de Gaulle is blown away, and wastes no time in implementing the Abominable Snow's 101 creations. Oprah Villainy opens the door to Corio. Casca Highbottom makes him use the cat flap. As the Dean of the Academy and the original mind behind the Hunger Games, one may wonder if Peter Dinklage is playing himself, for little Cass is a miserable little bastard. If he had played one of Snow White's seven dwarfs, he would have needed a new name. Asshole. When Dinklage is not down in drinks, he's dunking on the mentors and the games. After Corio makes an illegal trip to the zoo to feed his pet pirate princess, Pint Size Pete becomes his sworn enemy. A Lannister always pays his debts. A high bottom never forgets. Snow sometimes turns yellow or brown. Gladiators, are you ready for a song that makes the nation weep like their mourning a North Korean dictator? Lucy's lullabies have the power to make grown men cry, but are they enough to make them die? The most diverse Hunger Games in history starts with a bang. Their bodies hit the floor like Thor, 
What's in store is not in the recording studio, but hiding under the arena, waiting to burst into song. As the tributes fall one by one, Lucy shacks up with her tribute friend Jessup. What's up? Everything, for he soon chases her through the arena like a rabid dog. Jessup has rabies from a bat bite, and now he tries to bite chunks out of Juicy Lucy. Is this the day the music died? No, because crafty Corio smashes a drone carrying a bottle of water straight into Jessup's rabies heart, and he promptly falls to his death. Now the songstress has a bigger problem. She is surrounded on all sides like a scene from Jurassic Park. Coral and her friends go in for the kill. Is this the end of Lucy Gray? Guess again. Corio smashes more water bottles to douse the threat, and Lucy escapes. It turns out that Hunger Games is a water sport. Fed up of seeing water instead of slaughter, Dr. Gall unveils her master plan. Bring on the snakes. All the tributes must die. She drops the tank of snakes in the center of the arena, and the tributes flee like rats. Except one, Wovi. The Hunger Games first Down Syndrome tribute has thus far been clever and cunning, constantly running, staying in the shadows. Until now, because she wants her new best friend, a pet snake. A big mistake. Wovi is snake steak. They devour her in seconds and then turn to the other tributes for seconds. The snakes plow through the checkbox crew like Pac Man through cookies. Pat Butcher gets butchered. Only Lullaby Lucy is left. As the serpents squeeze her limbs, the world watches on in horror. Will Lucy become a snake's movie? Wait, what's that? Is it an angel? A Vita reborn? Lucy opens her lips and the snakes loosen their grips. Hearts move, tears flow, the vipers stop. Lucy's soothing melody softens the serpents and dastardly Dr. Gall can't believe it. Her evil plan is lost to the sound of music. She bioengineered the most vicious man-eaters in existence, but they have no resistance to the undeniable beauty of Rachel Ziegler's voice. Game's over, winner winner, not snake dinner, Lucy Greybeard has done it. After the celebrations, Drinklage checks the snake tank. Aha! The fix was in, slippery snow rigged the whole thing. He smothered a letter in Lucy's sweet scent and dropped it in the tank. Once the snakes got a whiff of her intoxicating sweat, there was no way they would kill her. More likely to worship her, only a goddess could smell of such a heavenly fragrance. Casca Littlebottom exiles a cheating anus to District 12 for 20 years to work as a peacekeeper, and it is there he becomes Eminem. Will the real Coriolanus please stand up? Sir Janus joins him in his work, but it is not long before they stumble upon Lucy Gray. She's now a smash hit singing sensation touring her home district with songs like Corio and Lucy's love blossoms, so too does Sir Janus' work with the Rebellion. The trio are cornered and confronted by two naughty eavesdroppers about his plans to aid the rebel cause. The punishment for treason? Hanging. Corio does not hang around. He shoots the snoopers in cold blood, and they all agree, mums the word. In a shocking twist, Corio twists to the dark side. Darth Slim Shady secretly records Sir Janus confessing his rebel nature and sends the recording by genetically modified carrier pigeon to Volumnia Gaul. His BFF is R.I.P. Corio destroys the incriminating guns and locks aim on his final target, Lucy Gray. Playtime is over. Snow is a man possessed by the spirit of Jack Nicholson. Here's Johnny! He hunts down the Snow White songstress, but is bitten by a snake. Poetic. The bard bolts and Corio returns to the capital. Upon the death of their son, Sejanus, the powerful and unaware plimps, agreed to adopt Coriolanus, and now he's back as his true self, a white male villain. Dr. Gall reveals she was the one who sent Corio to District 12. Only through seeing the violence of men up close and personal could Coriolanus unleash his true power. The people of Panem must be ruled by an iron fist soaked in blood. 
Master Gaul has a new apprentice. One last stop. Hello, Highbottom. The Dean is deep in regret. And a drink. He conceived the idea for the Hunger Games in a drunken stupor, but Corio's father, Crassus, took it serious. Every day since, he has drowned his remorse in booze and tried to down the games. Corio is not here for an AA meeting. Bye bye, Drinklage. The teen tyrant spikes his drink with rat poison, and the little misery says cheerio. No one can thwart the rise of a blonde haired, blue eyed evil in Panem.